Namaste, Ashish. Welcome. Welcome to Ahimsa Conversations. Um, so what is your earliest memory, personally, from your childhood of uh, either the ideal or the practice or the even the violation of uh, non-violence? Yeah, I think uh, maybe it was a combination of things. I don't remember any particular incident as such, but uh, maybe two or three things. One is that uh, we are, uh, at least on paper, we're Jains. And uh, though neither of my parents were, you know, strongly religious, uh, my father definitely wasn't. My mother used to occasionally talk about Jainism and especially the values of, uh, you know, uh, respecting all life and so on. She was very strongly vegetarian. My father was not. Uh, so I was growing up in a, in a mixed kind of thing, but obviously there must have been some amount of influence from my mother's side, especially. Uh, around uh, middle and high school, I also got quite interested in animal rights issues. I was just fond of animals and didn't like seeing the way in which uh, violence was being inflicted on them. Uh, I remember in particular, I think high school, maybe ninth or 10th standard, I was beginning to read about the experiments on monkeys that India used to export to the US, some really horrible, horrifying experiments, uh, but also generally on the streets, how animals were being treated and all. So that's something that kind of got, uh, got me uh, passionate about, at least, you know, looking at issues of animals. And then the third thing I think was also because of both parents, my father's work and some of the sort of intellectual social atmosphere around me, a lot of it was Gandhian. Um, I mean, there were also elements of Marxism, etc. But Gandhi was obviously a very strong influence. My father had also worked in the independence struggle a little bit with him. Um, so I suppose that must have also had some kind of bearing on it. So I think these were sort of early school time influences. I think uh, I don't remember any particular incident uh, as such. So then as a grown up, Ashish, how did, uh, did or rather did the concept of ahimsa deeply inform your activism or was it uh, something else? Because see, you grew up at a time when, uh, and you were growing up in Delhi, around the Delhi University campus. Uh, were you ever in, tempted, you know, by say, the Naxalite movement? Not really. I think, I mean, we, we of course, we were, we were hearing about it. There were lots of discussions being Delhi University, of course, there were lots of discussions on it. Um, also had friends in JNU, of course, which were where it was quite strong as a, as a narrative. Um, but I think the sort of early years of experience with uh, Kalpurik 1978, 79 onwards, so still in high school and then moving into college, um, maybe two or three experiences that I can recount, which uh, much more strongly embedded uh, non-violence in me, not necessarily explicitly, but kind of as a background uh, phenomenon. One was in 1980 and 81, we did two long trips through the Tehri Gadwal region, uh, meeting up with the Chipko movement people, especially women in the villages. Um, you know, and this was a sort of mix of adventure, fun and learning. And uh, there, uh, we, I and others, we got a very strong sense, both of the uh, sort of tactics that these women were using uh, to save, to protect forests, uh, and also sometimes struggle against their own menfolk, uh, and therefore also the gender issues. Um, and in that, of course, we were also getting exposed to other issues like, say, domestic violence uh, against women, which is not just in cities, it's also in villages. You know, things that in Delhi we would never actually have learned about or never at least at least not experienced in some way. So that's one thing. The whole Chipko kind of experience was very strong. The second was that uh, being interested in wildlife and animals, like I said, um, conservation was obviously a very strong part of the, the interest and the work that we started with. And in 1982, I think it was, there was this really horrible incident of uh, seven villagers being killed in the Bharatpur uh, Kela Dev National Park, the bird sanctuary in Rajasthan, because overnight uh, the government stopped grazing, buffalo grazing, which had traditionally been a right inside the area. They stopped it. The villagers tried to forcibly enter. There was police firing and seven villagers were killed. And that really shocked us when we got the news. Uh, we immediately had an investigation. Kalpuriksh did an investigation immediately after the firing. And uh, 
in a way that kind of brought home a certain uh, you know a violence of conservation which otherwise was not really so apparent uh, to me but to say that you know in the name of protecting wildlife if people are being killed there's some problem there there's there's, there's something fundamentally problematic there um so there was violence against animals which i started off with but then there's also violence against people in the name of animals and clearly there's some flaw there and the third thing i think was it would have been 19 uh, is it 1984 the sikh the anti sikh riots um in delhi where it was happening all around us uh, i could see the signs of violence everywhere we did sort of walk through some of the areas my both my father and my older brother smitu got involved with uh, doing an investigation on who was responsible and things like that and sort of that brought home the the violence of of religious dogmatism of politics and religion mixing up etc cetera, etc cetera. so i think these were and there are many others but i mean these are some of the things maybe one more that i can mention quickly is which is not really about physical violence against people as such in the conventional way of thinking about it but one of the investigations we did early on in kalpavriksh was looking at the impacts of the badarpur thermal power station just outside delhi and we found that it was very badly affecting the health and the crops and the lives of the village uh, moladband i still remember the name right next to it which was a village which not which was not even getting the electricity from the power station and so the in that sense kind of beginning to think about the violence of uh, you know processes of what we call development uh, which came home much more uh, clearly when we did the narmada investigation which i can talk about later so there uh, so it's i think these four three four five years of formulation especially in the kalpavriksham the kind of activism we were doing or the learning that we were happening that was happening to us which brought home the uh, both the 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 idea and the concept and the practice of violence but also the practice of non violence in movements that were trying to resist what was happening Ashish, in this context, maybe this is the right point to, for uh, you to talk about that Narbada study because I remember very much uh, in the early days when we were all first hearing about the issue to do with the Narbada dams and the magnitude of the destruction it would involve. It was Kalpavriksha study based on a very extensive uh, period spent on the ground. in the valley that really awakened us to the multi dimensional nature of what was going to be lost what was going to be submerged uh, by the uh, the dams uh, so can you you know talk about that and say what were the various forms of cultural uh, heritage that you saw threatened by uh, the dams Yeah, so I think it was in 1982, probably that uh, I and a few other colleagues started talking about the the idea. Was a friend of mine, Rajiv Parthris, uh, who was from that area, who kind of said, "Look, Narmada uh, is a fantastic river. I've grown up there, and uh, uh, but there is this proposal for 30 big dams uh, on the main river and on the tributaries, and maybe we should do a yatra to to kind of look at." Uh, the river and what the possible impacts of these dams are so we immediately jumped on the idea both because it was of course an interesting idea to look at from a from the point of view of environment development etc but also as an adventure because uh, we decided then that we would go all the way from the mouth of the river in baruch up to the source in amarkantak which is a 1300 km journey as a as a kind of an amusing aside we actually uh, Uh, applied for funding to the ministry of uh, sports um where they had a promotion of adventure scheme in which they gave 15 rupees per person per day for uh, any kind of adventurous activity we applied and we got the money also <laughs> uh, for so, a 40 day or something did you walk all the way yeah so no uh, we did a combination of walking boating and busing okay we walked quite a bit uh, it was a 50 day uh, we walked quite a bit but also of course 1300 kilometers and because this was all also happening during our summer vacations now we didn't have uh, other times to do it we did a year later we also did uh, the same thing in amarkantak we spent a month in amarkantak looking at the source and the, the mining that was happening up in the plateau of amarkantak where uh, of amarkantak where the rivers originates 
but anyway so in this this kind of trip um one was just sort of uh, understanding the river the ethos of the river and it is culturally an extremely important river in fact uh, most people say that it's even more sacred than the than the ganga and the ganga goes as a black cow to the narmada bathes itself and emerges as a white cow um and one of the uh, very strong practices which was there i don't know if it's there anymore because now so much of the area submerged uh, was the parikrama where people would walk all the 2600 kilometers barefoot with nothing on them except uh, you know the little bit of clothes and one matka or sorry one lota for uh, for water and there was a tradition of every village along the way leaving aside a part of their agricultural produce to feed these parikrama vasis um and we also so we met a lot of them of course and it was what was fascinating was of course not just the religious the religious belief and so on but also that they were carrying stories from one part of the valley to another part uh you know and in a way becoming almost like messengers or or, or news uh, you know journalists so to speak um anyway so when we then investigated uh, the the dam itself we the, i mean the proposals uh, we realized that there's going to be multiple different impacts uh the the ecological of course was very obvious with the submergence of vast amounts of extremely rich forest the social with the displacement of hundreds of thousands of people if all those 30 dams were to be built and the cultural which is not just the destruction of things like the parikrama you can't do a parikrama anymore if you have 10 huge reservoirs in your way your 2600 kilometers would become i don't know 10000 kilometers um but also the narmada valley is the oldest valley in india possibly one of the oldest in the world geologically and culturally so it's got prehistoric remains it has archaeological remains all kinds of stuff a lot of which was in the submergence zones of the uh, and i'm not even talking about physical structures like temples and mosques and all that's lots of that but i'm i'm talking about even much older things uh, fossils fossil beds so there was there's going to be there has been subsequently of course huge cultural uh, devastation also probably lost a lot of things which we have never even investigated or studied um and anyway so what all of this brought home to us was what i said about the uh, thermal power station in in delhi which was that uh, it wasn't just about saying do we do we want an alternative development form but that development fundamentally seemed to us to be violence there was something at the at the root of the concept itself not just how it was being implemented but at the root of the concept itself which seemed to us to be violence and actually since then at least my own uh, inclination has has been to look at alternatives to development if we want peace and harmony and non violence rather than simply saying inclusive development sustainable development etc yeah you were also quite closely involved with the narmada bachao andolan which yeah. assiduously remained uh, non violent uh, medha has already been part of these conversations she has talked in detail about how much that impulse came from among the people themselves mm. uh and yet in this larger you know reflection or dynamic uh, discussion on the dynamic between violence and nonviolence there remains a school of thought which says uh, what did the narmada bachao andolan gain by remaining nonviolent the dams were still built medha disagrees with that but i want to hear how you look at this question that uh you know how do you today say we are now almost 30 years down the line from when the andolan was at its height i know that the andolan is still alive but i'm saying from its uh, high point of activity to today how does it look now this decision to stay with non violence as a method and as a as a way of uh, being so i think there's two three ways to look at it um when somebody says that look it didn't it didn't achieve its objective of stopping the dams probably because it was non violent uh one can only look at the history of of violent rebellions etc across the world and see that probably an equal number even more might have been unsuccessful i know that in this particular case for instance gujarat government being gujarat government uh they wouldn't have hesitated to move uh, armed police in um uh, as has happened in so many other parts of india right so uh instead of it being a 30 40 year long movement and still being active at least to be able to 
get some semblance of rehabilitation for the people who are being displaced and to continue raising those issues as a public uh, discussion uh, i think that wouldn't have happened within a few years that thing would have just died down because you would have had police violence and everything would have been scattered um but that's a that's a tactical issue you know whether one uses that as, as a tactic or not i think the the power of it being non violent was the uh what should i say the sort of the ethical message that was being given across not just the narmada valley but all of india and all the world the whole world if you look at it in a way that kind of spawned a whole lot of other similar non violent protests in many other parts of the world some of which were in fact successful in stopping destructive projects uh, it also began to it also uh, sort of networked with other similar movements around the world Ashish, can you mention some of those successful movements by name? Can you just mention them? Here? Well, actually, in the Narmada Valley itself, if you look at it, instead of the thirty big dams, eventually we ended up with maybe what six or seven or eight or something like that. Uh, and, and I, I mean, this is obviously a bit of speculation, but I'm reasonably certain that state governments got simply too worried and scared that you know similar movements will happen all across the valley, which they wouldn't be able to manage. And uh, Uh, also, uh, the, the 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 delays caused by the movement, which are then blamed on the movement, saying, "Look, you caused these delays; therefore, the project became so expensive." But in some sense, the 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 possibility of staying something that was destructive, the possibility of stopping World Bank from funding it, etc., was something that that uh, also spurred a lot of uh, interest and and uh, uh, so on. So, if you if you look at uh, uh, movements that are not necessarily anti-dam, but like Uh, against extractivism for instance in other parts of india and the world uh, there was inspiration i i mean i remember meetings with uh, some networks in other parts of the world where narmada was sort of the talking point is to say that look against such powerful forces if you can have a non violent movement of 10 20 30 000 people then we can do something similar in uh, in our areas but or even probably more important than that uh, is the fact that it generated a a national debate probably for the first time which even say chipko etc could not do even silent valley could not do is that narmada for various reasons actually uh, became a almost a household word um, and it became the symbol for questioning the mode of development uh, and i think that was very very powerful in that sense so one can say it didn't succeed in the specific objective of stopping the sadar sarovar or the narmada sagar but i think in all these other ways uh, it, it was uh, massively massively inspirational and uh, and useful um but uh, sorry there was a uh, second part of what you were asking me I sort of lost track of that the uh, movements back. elsewhere you were mentioning uh, the the global influence yeah yeah so uh, so i think the thing is that uh, the, the notion of actually a non violent uh, maybe we can come and come to it later but let me mention it here also is that non violence as a strategy and then non violence as a uh, as an ethic as a, as a principle and sometimes you can actually see that they may not necessarily come together and i think the example i can think of uh, is the kurdish uh, women's movement or the kurdish ethnic ethnic uh, movement in uh, uh, in 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 western asia between you know, syria iraq iran and uh, turkey where uh, the historically persecuted uh, ethnic community the kurdish have been trying to create a whole region of autonomy and uh, freedom and democracy and eco feminism and so on and they have an army there's a women's army and a, a men's army right now i i remember speaking a few years back to a couple of their uh, leaders and i said look um, you profess eco feminism and radical democracy and so on which to my mind uh, would also have to be fundamentally based on an ethic of non violence towards each other and towards the rest of nature uh, so how do you justify an army and what they said was that we don't want to have the army the army is purely self defense because if it wasn't there we would be totally wiped out um and so it's it, we, we don't use it as aggression in any form and we will not use it as aggression it's self defense as soon as these neighboring nation states or whatever it is stop uh, persecuting us in the way they're doing it and it's it's very violent persecution uh, we will disband the army 
and since then i've actually been toying with the idea which i still haven't done uh, of having a imaginary conversation between gandhi and uh, some of the kurdish women i think it would be fascinating to do that uh, also to bring out the nuances in in what gandhi said about non violence which most people kind of tend to uh, not know yeah. so anyway so these were i think some of the things because even at that time uh, the nationalism was of course very very central to this and people were saying why should narmada not move in that direction there were elements within the movement people within the valley obviously who were saying no let's just uh, uh, put a bomb under the under the upcoming dam or kill a few of the top level officials and they'll stop and uh, there was very vehement discussion within the organization also sometimes on that and saying that no this is not something that we want to do not only as a tactical thing but even as an ethical thing we don't want to kill anybody if you burst the if you put a bomb under the dam very very uh, um, tempting thought uh you could end up killing hundreds of people downstream for instance or officers and workers working on the dam so that's not something we want to do ashish you've done extensive work on alternative movements and uh, at a community level efforts that are by doing and through their action showing that uh, the very concept of development can be redefined in what ways has this impulse for non violence been reflected i mean if you i know this is a tall order because there are so many stories you have to tell but if you want to do an overview um in that va in fact i because vikalp sangam's uh, you know sign is also right behind you how is this impulse getting reflected in the stories you document on that network i mean on that platform i think many ways so so far what i've spoken about is resistance but if we look at if you look at the incredible uh, constructive alternatives people are doing all over the world and i've been fortunate enough to have been involved with some of them or or at least be uh, have been able to document them and make great friendships with people in those uh, processes um what i see is many different forms of sometimes explicitly stated sometimes implicit uh non violent uh, relationships and ethics so let's take the example of for we me which has been in, in incredibly ex- inspiring over the last 25 years is the dalit women farmers of telangana part of the deccan development society who have over the last 30 years completely transformed their lives from being uh, very severely marginalized hunger malnutrition lack of access to education health facilities etc and being marginalized as women and as dalits to one where they have actually immense respect in their own villages by transforming their agriculture and moving towards uh, or asserting their food sovereignty now when you speak to them what comes out so clearly is not just the mechanics of how they are growing their food and how they are productive even with organic farming and their own traditional seeds and all of that which is of course important but probably even more important how they view seeds how they view the earth and it's so it's so infused with non violence that it's very it's it's even hard to describe it uh the earth is a mother you can never be violent towards it the seeds are sacred you have to respect them uh you have you cannot waste them you cannot uh, and you can't do things like genetic engineering and so on on them because that's a violation of of the sacredness that they have that they you know have uh and also then relations with each other that as fellow farmers fellow women you can even be an upper caste farmer uh, and if you come to me asking for seeds or help which some of the upper caste farmer land uh, men are doing i'm not going to say no because you persecuted me in the past i will look at you with respect and say yes okay here here's our knowledge here's what we can offer you um and even with the men because the men were extremely resistant to all of this in the beginning uh, when when women for instance were asserting uh, their rights to the land um, and and asserting their knowledge on seeds men were resistant but it wasn't like there was massive fights and things like that it was just quiet ways of uh, of uh, asserting and of uh, convincing that this is the way to do it so for me this has been an in- incredible uh, learning of how you look at uh, your day to day life in a non violent uh, manner right or a peaceful harmonious manner coexistence with the rest of nature and with each other um we can think of so many other examples now it's interesting also so for instance if you look at adivasi cultures in central india um 
you know, iconic places like Mindha Lekha, which asserted self-governance 30, 40 years back, uh, Korchi, Mahagram Sabha, and many others. Now, it's not that they have a non-violent lifestyle. They're not vegetarians, vegans, etc., etc. And this is where, at least over the last couple of decades, my own understanding of, of, uh, of even things like, you know, food or uh, uh, how does one look at uh, plants and animals uh, and each other, uh, has become much more nuanced. Earlier, possibly, you know, my early years of animal rights kind of thing, I would have looked down upon anybody who was eating meat or uh, veganism wasn't a big thing then, but if it had been, I would probably have become vegan. Uh, but now I understand that, look, there's, there's violence also in the homogenized way in which you might look at something like food. We see that with beef, uh, beef politics right, these days, right? Um, and so these Adivasis, they hunt. Uh, now, for me as an animal rights activist, I say, oh my God, there's hunting happening. Uh, but they don't hunt for commercial uh, sport. They, they don't hunt for pleasure. Uh, uh, nor for pleasure. It's, it's for, I mean, some have begun to do it because market influences have come in. But uh, it's, it's for survival, for food. And in that sense, it's their right to life, which they are asserting. Um, so you realize that what could seem to be a violent act is actually part of a very non-violent lifestyle because they are being in, in some sense of harmony with, with uh, and the rest of nature. Whereas you can take a Jain community, my, my uh, family's community, many of whom are incredibly rich uh, business uh, men and business women who will set up these huge statues uh, in the middle of uh, nature, destroying forest or whatever it is of, of you know, uh, Adi, Lord Adinath or, or Mahavir or whoever, or build these massive uh, mandirs with, uh, with marble that has been mined from some area, which has caused immense violence to nature. Yeah. So, and, and, but they'll be vegetarian and they won't eat carrots and potatoes and things like that because it's from under the ground and causes violence. I've had lots of uh, fights with many of my relatives on this. So I think uh, in that sense, one has to be much more nuanced about um, about this. And I, I, and, and I see that in the radical alternatives, that there are these nuances, this very, very deep sense of nonviolence, harmony, peace, solidarity, uh, but it doesn't get translated in a mechanical way in, the, in their everyday lives. That's right. As part of this, Ashish, you've also been involved with the degrowth discourse, which was born out of Europe, but I think it would be fair to say now that it's a global uh, point of reflection and exploration. So uh, I've always seen degrowth as a form of striving towards nonviolence. So how would you see it? But you would have to, for the sake of many of our listeners who would not have heard this term before, I would request you to do a very a brief summary of what degrowth is and uh, what do you see as the potential for uh, building upon this as a positive construct? Well, I think it comes the, the sort of takeoff point for degrowth is the realization, which is getting stronger and stronger, that economic growth in whatever form is simply not sustainable. Uh, you can't have sustainable growth, green growth, uh, inclusive growth, etc. It doesn't make sense on a planet that is finite. So, from an ecological perspective, degrowth is a uh, sorry, growth is a is a, a contradiction. Uh, sustainable growth is a contradiction in terms. Um, and uh, so that's the let's say the starting point. But the other starting point has also been, and this is why it started off in Europe, could also have happened in North America, for instance, but it didn't. Was that we as a as a society um, as industrialized countries have already grown too much. And we, our ecological footprint across the earth is well beyond our boundaries. Um, and it is unsustainable. We are living at several times what the earth can, can sustain. Um, so therefore we need to scale down significantly in material terms, in uh, energy terms, so basically overall consumption. The we, the we here being the people of the North. Correct. So the global, that's why I'm saying Europe, that's where it started. So uh, from activists in Europe or from academics in Europe who actually started saying that the industry, the, let's say the global north, that is to say the well-to-do everywhere in the world, which could also be the well-to-do in, in India, uh, uh, who are over-consuming, who, who are living unsustainable lifestyles, which includes me, uh, have to scale down. But 
along with that came the thought that the scaling down is not just a material issue or an energy issue it's also about the philosophy of life it's also about how do we uh, think what is what is uh, uh, what is human progress uh, what does it mean to be human as fundamental a question as that right um and because we've seen that western modernity over the last 2 3 400 years colonial times onwards has pushed a certain universe uh, sorry universalizing homogenous way of looking at what is progress progress is where you move from uh, hunting gathering to agriculture to industry to digital blah 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 from being unclothed to clothed from being having so called kacha houses to having pakka houses uh, basically from from the, an oriental traditional kind of thing to a modern western uh, lifestyle uh, so that linear progression and they are uh, after those initial impulses in the degrowth movement they also started looking fundamentally at those sorts of, sorts of things which is actually to their credit because you know somebody who's grown up for generations or centuries in that kind of an atmosphere to question one, one's own cultural uh, and psychological and philosophical heritage so and there's many other aspects to this because this then also means that you have to question politics uh, the way politics is done right now because how can you actually build a uh, a society which is in harmony with the rest of nature unless people are also in charge of their own lives wherever they are if you leave it to politicians and bureaucrats that's not going to happen or if you leave it to corporations that's not going to happen so these are some of the fundamental things that Uh, has evolved over the last maybe 10 15 years it didn't start off like that but it's evolved like that the only thing i'd like to say here rajni i think which is very important is that um um i have been telling my degrowth friends and i have very very dear friends in the degrowth movement that degrowth shouldn't become another neo colonial concept in the alternatives arena so here you had growth which was exported all over the world and uh, became the mantra for all countries except bhutan maybe uh now we have the alternative thing which is okay degrowth all over the world and i've been saying look there's hundreds of concepts of this kind some from ancient world views of indigenous peoples like uh, ubuntu boen vivero sumak kause etc etc some from even histories of india like swaraj which i think and I, i should speak a little bit about swaraj because i think it's a very important part of looking at things non violently um and uh, some from uh, from the industrialized world apart from degrowth such as eco feminism or or uh, some elements of eco socialism or the simplicity movement which has come up from within the most uh, materially consumptive parts of the world and many others so i think it's very important to look at um, uh, um, uh, the pluriverse of radical alternatives which all point towards peace harmony solidarity non violence etc uh rather than thinking of one umbrella that will that we all then sort of uh, fit under and they are, i mean at least those in the the radical degrowthers completely accept this so we're trying to build we're trying to see okay how do you build these sorts of global alliances built on this respect of diverse plural ways of uh, living being dreaming understanding doing all of which challenge the currently dominant system but are internally quite diverse Uh, you want to complete that thought about swaraj oh yeah right so i think one of the since you have ta- you've written and done so much about ecological swaraj so i think one of the like i said one of my earliest influences was uh, was gandhi uh, not so much in reading but just what was happening around me family and larger circles uh, chipko and you know people in the chipko movement and many others uh, anupam mishra gandhi peace foundation so many aspects of it which most, many of which i probably even forgotten by now um and so the 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 notion of swaraj was kind of it kept coming but i never really fully understood it i i still don't think i fully understand it but in the last few years when trying to think of what are what are comprehensive holistic alternatives what what would a ideal society what could an ideal society look like uh i tried to dig deeper into it uh with some other colleagues people like asim shivastav with whom i wrote uh, the book churning the earth and others and i i found uh that it was such so much deeper a notion than western liberal democracy in many different ways um because it wasn't simply about uh electing and you know having universal suffrage and things like that uh it wasn't also simply about everybody being involved in decision making which is say, let's say what direct democracy is 
but it was also about the assertion of freedom and autonomy from the individual to the collective or the community with responsibility towards your freedom and autonomy and which means that i can't say i will run my suv wherever i want or i will go and bomb iraq because i want its petrol because that's my right that's my that's the freedom i want um because then i'm undermining somebody else's right to freedom autonomy self reliance etc and then what i think gandhi also meant if you look at some of the writings uh, and even if he didn't we're trying to extend that gumarappa probably meant it much more explicitly we're trying to ex- extend that to say responsibility towards not just you as human being but towards all of life all the rest of nature and that's why eco swaraj or prakritik swaraj or ecological swaraj um so i think in that sense the notion of swaraj is so is so imbued with with peace and harmony and interconnectedness and solidarity and responsibility and simplicity that uh, to me it's uh, and there are similar ones like goin vivir in south america ubuntu in latin america, in southern africa and others that to me that kind of it symbolizes where i think we need to we need to head Yeah. Uh, food sovereignty by some communities for instance is called annas swaraj because again it's not just about the physical control of seeds and things like that it's so much deeper as a spiritual notion also that's right and and that how deeply self reliance the ability to have some sense of agency over your own destiny how central that is to people's sense of the good life or of well being and it's anchored in non violence am i right Oh absolutely absolutely so for instance when prime minister modi talks about uh, atmanirbhar bharat um and suddenly in the middle of the covid crisis realizes ki every village has to become self reliant atmanirbhar and every district and every state in the country as a whole but when you then when you see his package of atmanirbhar bharat it actually has nothing to do with self reliance definitely not at a local self reliance kind of thing so whereas in fact what these uh, you know going back to the dalit women farmers of uh, deccan development society i've been speaking to them in some way or the other through the whole covid period and they're saying that it's because we asserted self reliance in food and in local livelihoods that we've had no pro- problems with covid at all uh, no food issues no health issues um and so that's one example there are many others where where uh, if one wants to also if human beings for instance want to be also resilient in the fa- face of crises and we're going to see more and more of these crises coming in right whether it's health or it's climate or biodiversity or any inequ- all kinds of so war etc that if you want to be resilient then local self reliance for basic needs is absolutely crucial so that's food water energy housing uh, education health uh, etc and governance and the opposite of this is the structural violence that millions of people are having to deal with so ashish in closing but just so just rajini sorry just a minute on that which is and i should have mentioned this earlier i think the structural violence of development and especially globalized development which i already spoke about is is uh, very clear certainly one of the things we have not been so good at as environmentalists and i'm speaking certainly for myself is to also see the structural violence within society some of which is very old uh, gender came home to me as early as the chipko yatra days because but for instance casteism you know in a country like india this is such a uh, such a deep rooted structural violence also and i think that's the kind of thing if one is looking at holistic transformation then uh, all of these structural violences or for instance how people who are so called disabled are looked at Uh, or lgbtq or so many other and that's why pluralism diversity respect for uh, different ways of being and doing and living and and dreaming is so so very important here in which then equality equity all of this gets so i just wanted to quickly add that as sure. part of yeah, sure. uh, structural violence we have to also yeah. struggle against thanks uh, no so i was saying that in closing i was wondering if you could offer some advice to the young people who many of whom today i see are well becoming somewhat nihilistic i am quite disturbed to see how many and by young people i mean teenagers are saying to me we have made our species has made such a mess 
of this planet that if climate change is happening and it means that our species as a whole is threatened we deserve it and uh, i'm maybe these are you know the uh, angry thoughts of uh, very young people uh, because after all we know that there is a very positive energy that has also come to the top of the the global discourse through the what friday futures friday's future yeah so that is there but uh, i'm seeing since both these realities are coexisting there is despondency and uh, kind of nihilism and also there is of course a uh, kind of a last stand fight to save the future what advice would you give or what are some of the experience from your experience what can you share for those who want to engage in this struggle uh, by cultivating non violence inside and outside yeah i i i think so i think uh, one of the problems is the sort of the duality that has come into us between us and others and those others could be other people or it could be the rest of nature humans and nature we don't say humans and the rest of nature we say humans and nature um and which then allows us to kind of then sort of either sit back in complacence or sit back and have this kind of an attitude saying human beings deserve it so let human beings die out and everything else will survive um but on the other hand if we actually look at how within human species there are so many fantastic trends of not just saving oneself but also saving the other again other human beings other species going out of you know jumping out of one skin to actually save others uh, you see that in disasters you've seen it in covid times with with the expressions of solidarity across the world quite amazing yeah so um on every day you can see it uh, in some video or the other where somebody is risking their life to save a small puppy who's who might be drowning in a river i mean there's so many examples of this unfortunately what tends to happen is that uh, maybe there's something in the psyche or the, it's it's the way our media works or whatever it is that the disaster stories get uh, much more prominence and they stay in our heads much more than the positive stories and one of the things we've been trying to do is to remove that by actually projecting positive stories much much more than has been the case earlier uh, that's why we call sangam so you actually are able to show how whether you're old young whatever age you are and whatever uh, you know part of uh, society you're in there are incredibly positive things you can ma- you can do which bring out the inner you uh, or inner me uh, which is that of caring and sharing and and loving and so on not the inner me which might be selfish uh, etc i i don't want to get into this debate of what is fundamentally human being whether it's selfishness or it's a, a non unselfish let's say we, are, we we can be everything right or anything but when you are engaged in these sorts of positive activities why is it that after 42 years and seeing all the disasters around me i'm still hopeful and still passionate is because i've been lucky enough to be involved with some of these sorts of initiatives like i said earlier where even the most desperate community is in some sense still smiling and trying to change their uh, their their you know like the people displaced in narmada you've been displaced but then you still set up a jeevan shala so that your children are getting a different education than what you might might have got yourself right even in a displaced situation so i think that I, we need to get this sense across to to young people and i've been i spent the last one year sitting at the computer talking to i don't know several thousand young people trying to get this sense across and i i, I think i think there's a hunger for it in young people they're not getting it elsewhere there's a hunger to 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 hear to see and then be part of these sorts of positive experiences uh, which doesn't deny the negative reality in any way it's not like you put your head under a carpet and say everything is fine and hunky dory but it shows a possible way of dealing with that uh, uh, rather than being you know uh, doomsdayers and or or whatever other sort of pessimistic uh, views that that people have so we, before, we don't enough of this we to do much more on so called social media that's why i finally got myself on some of these things though i was resistant earlier instagram and etc etc uh, and uh, uh, and figure out ways of how one can really best communicate this graphic novels cartoons films videos memes and all kinds of new terms that i don't even know yet which we should also do apart from also the traditional uh, media like street theater and 
slow films and slow conversations and whatever all of that um so yeah i i really think there's a hunger for this right there is there is but just before we really really close uh, ashish can you say a little bit about vikalp sangam and to those who don't read hindi the sign at the back is vikalp which means alternatives and sangam which means confluence uh, and ashish is a co-founder of this network uh, because i it, i think it's a perfect way to close because that's a manifestation of what you just said 2 seconds ago Sure. Uh, so in 2014, I mean, it's been building up for a much longer period, but I was getting more and more unsatisfied with living a life of, uh, uh, what should I say, saying no to everything, no to mining, no to this government, no to authoritarianism, no to this, no to that, which we still need to do, but not really. And people are also asking, say, Tum to sab ka, sorry, you're saying no to everything. What is it you're saying yes to? Uh, what's your vision of life? What's your alternative, right? So that's why uh, we started... in any case already since the chipko yatra days we were seeing how uh, people had their own ways of conserving forests and wildlife right so we had that alternative already in mind but 2013 14 onwards or maybe 2012 onwards when asim and i wrote that book churning the earth in which three fourths of the book is is the bad news and then one fourth of the book is some of the alternatives i realized that i need to do much more focused systematic work on this and the rest of my life whatever is remaining i'll actually devote to looking at these radical alternatives um so but then we also realized that uh, there isn't any platform available for these fantastic things to come together you know the adivasis in central india the dalit women farmers in telangana etc etc all the all the chipko some elements of chipko still continuing um how do you create a non hierarchical non threatening space where these initiatives can talk to each other learn from each other constructively criticize each other build on each other's strengths help remove each other's weaknesses um and become more of a critical mass also for larger for macro changes so that these initiatives don't remain only in their own scattered uh forms uh, and also talk across sectors uh, if i am working on on sustainable farming you're working on gender justice somebody else is working on alternative education somebody on health how do we talk together so that we are learning each other's perspectives so that's the idea for vikalp sangam as a process um it has many different elements to it one of them is physical confluences where we meet for three or four days in a region or on a, on a thematic issue we've had confluences on food on energy on democracy on well being and in different parts of the world uh, of the uh, of the country specific to the region then there's documentation so the vikalpsangam.org website has more than i think 1500 stories of transformation from different parts of the world and different topics uh, then there's film making there's uh, uh, stimulating more uh, one to one or multiple sort of collaborations so many different elements to this and out of this has also emerged a more global process which is i need to have a banner on that somewhere uh, which is the global tapestry of alternatives because we realize that like vikalp sangam in india there are some other parts of the world which do also have their own networks of alternatives like crianza mutua in in mexico and colombia or say the commons network in parts of uh, europe or the degrowth network uh, or some of the buen vivir networks that are happening in south america so there are different sorry rajni you wanted to go ahead go ahead sorry so uh, but again um, there isn't really a platform to kind of bring them together the world social forum was partly an attempt to do that but has kind of got stuck in a bit of uh, quagmire and also is focused very largely on still on the resistance and the critique and that's needed but something which was able to bring uh, radical alternatives around the world together so the global tapestry was started uh, 2019 and we're doing a whole bunch of things under that also in vikalp sangam ashish is commitment to non violence a kind of a requirement or a uh, almost is it at all a condition for as a com- for the common ground for building the common ground or do you have a diversity of views on violence non violence in vikalp sangam and then we'll close with that um so we have since 2014 we've also been uh, trying to see if we can build a collective vision of what a radical uh, transformation or what an ideal society would be so we have a evolving document which is called in search of radical alternatives and one part of that is a statement of ethics and values and principles 
and non-violence figures there. So, but I remember at least two or three Vikalp Sangams in which it's, there's been very heated debate uh, on this, not so much the non-acceptance of non-violence, but what does it mean in real life? What does it mean in the movements? What does it mean in our relationship with each other, with the rest of nature, etc.? And there's no, there's no uh, total agreement on the specifics of it, but at least so far, the several thousand people who have taken part in this, and this range from very hardcore Gandhian to very uh, Marxist leftist kind of uh, groups to, I mean, different kinds of organizations, Adivasi groups, Dalit groups, etc., cetera, uh, urban environmentalists, feminist groups, and so on, that there seems to be a broad agreement that nonviolence should be one of the principles. Um, so that's where we are so far. It hasn't been tested. So, for instance, if one of the 65 organizations that are 70 organizations that are part of the core group of the Vikalp Sangam does engage in or support uh, any of, let's say, a violent uprising, then that would be maybe a test case where we would, uh, uh, you know, try see and, how the rest of the community responds. Yeah, yeah. And you remember the democracy Vikalp Sangam in which this was, you know, Kashmir, for instance, is a, is a case in point where you can, you can say there's violence both from state actors and from non-state actors. And how do we look at that? So I think these are things that need to evolve uh, over time. And hopefully we get more and more nuanced in our understanding also of what is nonviolence. Thank you so much. Thank you so much.